Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm going to talk about digital identity today. Just from the hallway talks, I know that you guys have already have a similar sister on your own called Bank ID, I think. Poland has something similar, uh, a fully legally legislated uh, ID system that has to be legally respected by every bank, every organization, every business in the country. There are some, th some things to learn and some mistakes not to repeat that you might, uh, you might want to hear. Uh, the talk is pretty much uh, scheduled as follows. It's divided into two parts. The, the first one is, is a practical part where we're going to just turn, turn ourselves as a, an, an attacker with pretty much no technical knowledge whatsoever. And the, the goal is to see how much can we abuse the system without any technical knowledge. Then we, we're going to go to the technical part when we are going to deep dive into some of the mechanisms that the, uh, that the system offers and we're going to see how can we break it. My name is Simon. I work as an IT security consultant for Securing, where I mostly deal with mobile application security. And before we dive in, a uh, quick disclaimer. Although I work for a company that offers penetration testing services, what you're about to show, uh, what you're about to see is a, is a result of a purely pro bono and no, non-commercial research. We haven't got paid for it. We're not leaking any client data or something like that. Uh, we just wanted to learn how the, how the system works and, and did it. Uh, the best way is to, to do it yourself. So I know that most of you uh, are from Sweden and probably have a similar system, but do we have anyone outside of Sweden that doesn't have a, a digital system working? Oh, I see some, two, two people. Well, if you did, well, if, if you're from Sweden and you use the bank ID, you can treat the stock pretty much to, to compare what, what's the difference between the, the Poland's version and the Swedish version, what, what are the differences, what are the similarities? Maybe, maybe your system is, is more secure by design than, than our was. And if you didn't, pretty much it will be a matter, only a matter of time before you will, because, because there's a big push towards you know, implementing those systems. There's a EU regulation that basically requires every EU country to, to create something like that. And you know, learn other, other, other mis others' mistakes. About the political background, uh, there is a regulation in the EU called the EIDES, which basically requires all EU member states to to create and implement some sort of digital ID. And the, the further goal is to basically introduce a me mechanism of interoperability between those states. So me, with a, with a, as a Polish national with Polish digital ID, in the future I could basically verify uh, myself with, with your bank ID application. They should work uh, in tandem. So we had in Poland our own legislation, the M Citizen Application Act, which uh, which introduced the application, which introduced also legal ramifications. So basically, trying to fake the application in any way would uh, be as equal as creating a, a physical fake ID, and also uh, in, introduced uh, another more than just an ID document. So the application in itself has a driver's, driver's license, student ID, uh, attorney, attorney card, and, uh, and a bunch of other systems uh, introduced at once. So the scope uh, for the research is a mobile application called the M Obywatel, which I'll reference as M Citizen, which is the Polish translation. So uh, let's dive into the, the practical part where, as I've said, we have no technical knowledge towards the system and we'll try to abuse it as much as possible. For, I think for, for your for bank ID case, the, the, the application usually consists of two main, uh, main processes. The onboarding stage, where you just install the app and want to uh, obtain your ID for the first time. And there's the, also the verification process, which involves some, some data sharing. So you want to verify yourself that your ID is, in fact, uh, authentic and, uh, and real. For the practical part, we're going to just focus on the verification process. As I've said, we don't have any technical knowledge, and the uh, onboarding process is fairly a bit more complex. So the government introduced basically three ways to, to verify someone using the application. Each subsequent version introduced is, is basically 
more sound in terms of security. The first one is the visual verification, where you basically look at somebody else's screen, and there's a bunch of I don't know, holograms or graphics that respond to your phone's gyro movement. There is a time and date shown, and the, the basic security principle is to, to defend against, let's say, a screenshot. So you can't just screenshot the app, Photoshop the data to someone else, and go to the bank and cash out his, uh, all of his money. Then we have the functional verification, which is a bit more, uh, I would say, uh, involves just convincing the, uh, making you just make some unrelated uh, action within the application. So just let's, let's, let's you log out out of the application and log back in, or just close the application, open some other module within the application. So here we're trying to defend against, let's say, screen recording attacks, or GIFs, or GIFs. Uh, so, and then you have the cryptographic verification, which involves basically two separate phones. One phone is uh, displaying a QR code that the other phone is scanning. There is some magic happening in the background, and, and the data is exchanged with some cryptographic protocol um, in the background. So now that you know, there are three, three verification methods. In, that's, the, that's the theory. In reality, in practice, Pretty much nobody uses the, the second and third verification method. As it currently stands, people just look at your screen, say, oh, that looks good enough, and just let you go. So to, to visualize it further, let's imagine four different organizations, each with a pretty, pretty high risk impact, with different risk, risk profile, and let's ask ourselves, what are the risks associated with, with lack of proper ID verifications for those organizations? So, for a clinic, let's imagine you're an attacker that, try, that managed to success, successfully bypass ID verification. You could presumably steal someone else's medical records. For an airline, let's say you're a fugitive wanted by, by, by the law, law enforcement uh, agencies, so you might want to escape the, or f flee the country. For a telecommunications company, you have the, the pretty common SIM swapping attack, which is you create a, a copy of someone else's SIM card that you can later use to obtain two-factor authentication codes via the SMS. And then for bank, pretty standard, pretty, pretty obvious. If you could just go to the bank and, uh, and verify yourself as someone else, you could, in theory, just withdraw all of his money from his account. So let's, also, let's check which of these four different organizations use the strongest verification method, which is the, the cryptographic QR code scanning thingy. As I've said, this is a practical part, so these are a, a hidden camera recordings from, from real world organizations that we, try, we, um, we just tested. So here's a clinic, and the verification process will begin now. And the, the, the recording is kind of cropped, but as you can see, the lady is just reading from something from my phone. Now the, the verification has finished, so I can basically, let's say if I'm, if I'm an attacker, that I could ask the lady to give me all medical records of someone else. For an air, airport, same thing, waiting in line be, before the, we enter the plane. As you can see, the, the girl in front of me is showing her physical ID, which is checked. And then I walk in, I show the application. The verification has successfully been finished, and I just can walk in. Now the telecommunications company uh, similar stuff. I walk in. I say, "Hey, I've lost my phone. Can I? Uh, I and uh, I've lost my SIM card. Is there a way to get a duplicate one?" Yeah, go ahead. I insist on using the M Citizen application instead of a physical ID, um, which is by law uh, required to be accepted. So the verification process starts. The the guy is. I presume just reading my, my name and my social security number. The verification has been finished, as you can see. Also took like two or three seconds. And now it's just a matter of reading some, uh, or write, uh, 
or just uh, accepting some terms and, and serve of conditions, uh, signing some papers. And at the end, I'm, I get handed a duplicate SIM card of, of myself, I guess. And I just walk in, I have a, a duplicate SIM card. So now let's see how it looks like in the bank. So we, I would say this is the, the highest level of security that should be applied for, for bank. I, I go in, I ask, I would like to close my account and vi withdraw all the money that, that I have. Again, I insist on using the application instead of physical ID. And at first I thought that uh, it will, it's gonna work again in the bank. I'm gonna just close my account, withdraw all the money, just using the, the lowest level of security that the government is uh, recommending. As you can see, the lady is, is collecting some data from my, from my phone. I get, um, I get a rush thinking that it's gonna work, but after a minute I get asked to scan a QR code that is displayed on the lady's laptop which is the proper way of, the most, the most secure way of sharing data or verif verifying your identity uh, within, the, within the system. So as you can see, I scan the QR code, input a very secure pin, and my data is shared, shared in a secure way. So, to answer the question, how many uh, organizations use the strongest method of verification? Only one out of three, uh, one, only, only the bank uses. So all of the lower tier risk uh, organizations, such as Telecom, which is still a very high risk uh, organization, uses just the plain verif visual verification method. So now that we know that, that you can basically just w show someone else's phone, with, show, show the phone with someone else's data, what's stopping the attacker from creating a, a so called M hacker tool, which basically injects your own custom arbitrary data into the legitimate application. So as you can see, here's the real M citizen application with all of its functionality. It's not some copycat clone. It has all the, all the features, all the watermarks, all the images that respond to, to your phone's gyro. And then I have the uh, M hacker app installed, which is just a plain app with a bunch of forms that I can quickly edit. To, to change some change my name, change my photo, change my so, social security number, basically change anything that I want to, to successfully bypass the visual and functional verification. As you can see, I change uh, my name, I change a photo to someone else, and I go back to the application, the, the legitimate one. Once I do that, I don't need to close the application, I just refresh the, the ID view, and I'm someone else. I don't need to, let's say, restart my phone, restart uh, someone else, restart the application. <laughs> so, uh, considering that, you know, this this could pretty much be you if if your bank uh, banking bank ID application has no. Uh, if, if organizations do not require strong uh, verification, then what's stopping you from, you know, if, what's stopping the attacker from changing their data to you, going to, to a telecommunications company, getting a SIM card of you, and then once they get the SIM card, they get your Google account, your Facebook account. Here I'm actually impersonating my boss. <laughs> so again, it's a process which takes 20 to, to 30 seconds, doesn't require any technical knowledge if you have the app, uh, and I'm someone else. And to, to be honest, that is, a, that is a, one of the scenarios that we use during our physical penetration testing uh, um, scenarios. So we look for when we are, we are asked to, to you know, break into some organizations, into the office, and maybe plug some malicious stuff in there. We, the, the scenario that, that always works so far is we go to the organization's LinkedIn, check uh, for some, uh, for some uh, employee that is kind of new to the company so his face doesn't get recognized in, easily in the office. We, with the help of the M Hacker app, we change the, uh, our identity to, to, the, to, the, to that person. And then we just walk to the lobby and say, oh, I've lost my badge uh, or I left my badge at home. 
I don't want to drive to, to my home for an hour during the traffic. Can you just give me a temporary badge so I can just go in today? Here's my ID to, sh to prove to you that I am in in uh, indeed me. And it works every time so far. So ask yourselves, is it possible with, with your implementation? But what, I, what I'm showing you today now, at, at least at this point, is pretty much the same thing as a, as a fake ID, I'd say, with some slight differences, though. For the, the main difference is that it doesn't cost me anything to, to create this uh, new identity. I can change it in a matter of seconds, so it doesn't, uh, I don't have to have some shady company do the ID for me. It's infinitely scalable, scalable so I get all, all I need is a phone. And that's it. And it's also free to use, so no cost to the attacker. But as I've said previously, it only works for the first and second verification method. So you can bypass, you're basically attacking the person that is verifying the, the application. So you're attacking his eyes, basically. The, the cryptographic verification would not work because there is some cryptographic sign, uh, signing protocol involved that would be, wouldn't be possible to, to be bypassed with this simple trick. So now we go to the technical part where, where we're going to try to, to you know, um, dive deep into, into how the application works and what can go wrong. As I've said, there are two main processes within the application usually. I think it's pretty similar to, to yours as well. The on onboarding one and the verification process. Let's look uh, how the onboarding process looks like. I know that with your implementation, you're just scanning your passport and something like that with an uh, NFC tag or something like that. In this case, the, the process requires a trusted third party. It is usually a bank. So you're, to, to obtain your digital ID for the first time, you're basically asked to log into the bank and then uh, log in online to the bank and then select that you acknowledge the, uh, and you want to pass your data, which the bank has, to the government server. The, the data is passed in a, basically a side channel, so it is not possible for you to somehow listen to the data and change it while, while it's in traffic. And once the bank basically sends the data from, from its own da database to the government server, a user certificate is created that is then passed to you. So it's, uh, it's a process that requires basically a third party that uh, is a basically source of truth for your identity. Once that's finished, your ID is stored basically encrypted on your device's local storage with a key stored in, in, in a secure element, either on iOS or, on, or Android, and you cannot access it easily. So let's try to break that encryption and see what's under the hood, what, uh, what does the ID look like, technically speaking. It's a, something called government side container, which is basically a JSON blob that contains all of your data, like your name, surname, your photo, your ID number, your social security number. And then you have something called personal certificate, which is just a certificate that you can use to sign the data and prove that you are, um, you're in fact you. Here's a, an example of how a, a container looks like which is, as you can see, just a JSON file with some fields about your identity. And what's important is that appended to the, uh, to the container, to the JSON file, is a, is, a government issue, is a government signature. So the government takes the JSON file, signs it, and then appends the signature to the, to the JSON. So that is used for, for data integrity purposes. So if the data is signed, then you cannot just easily go break the, break the encryption and then just change some field in the JSON and go to, go, to bank, uh, go to the bank and verify yourself as someone else. So the, the uh, onboarding process looks strong. The, the process is pretty much invisible to the user because it requires uh, the third party is connecting directly with the government without your basically uh, need. And it requires a trusted third party that has your knowledge and is considered to be a source of truth. So now that you know that, let's look at the, the verification process, which is you have an ID, you want to securely verify it with, uh, let's say, in a bank. So how does it work under the hood? The 
the process, as I've said, requires two separate devices. One is uh, one is displaying a QR code that the later is scanning and and uh, sharing the data. Here's a, I think, animation that visualizes it better. So a QR code is shown. You scan a QR code. A data is uh, a screen is shown that hey, you are about to share data with, let's say, a bank in Poland. Here's the data you're gonna uh, you're gonna share in in a list. And once the, the once the verification is finished on the verifier's phone, there appears a, a full list of data that is that has been shared. So, as the first, let's say, uh, grasp to to grasp for something to attack, let's look what are the the QR codes storing. What information does these QR codes store? Apart from some uh, IDs or some dates, the the interesting fields are the document type, which is whether it is a ID or maybe it is a driving's license or maybe it's a student ID card. And, uh, and, the, and a pretty interesting field called the creator name. So who has created the QR code that, that is shown to your phone that, hey, you're about to share the data with, with that person. But there is no, pre there's pretty much no integrity of the data that is stored in the QR code. As you can see, there is no signature to append it to the data that is generated. So what if you just change the data of the creator to, to let's say, a police headquarters and try to use that as a, as a phishing uh, opportunity? Well, you generate the QR code, just, you just show it to, to someone, uh, he or she scans it in the application, and it turns out that they're trying to uh, share the information to the police headquarters. But still, it's pretty much, you get, you get shown this huge screen showing that you're about to share a bunch of data to, to potentially someone that is suspicious, which frankly can burn the, the whole operation. So what if we just play around with the, with the encoding in, within the creator name field and just let's add a bunch of new line uh, signs and a bunch of you know, enter signs at the end of the, our phishing message, generate the QR code, send it to someone, and let's see what happens. So as you can see, I have the application. I have some identity, and now I'm approached by someone that is trying, uh, that is convincing me to, to verify his data, uh, to, to send, for me to, to send him his, my data. So I get shown a QR code that I scan. And once I scan it, I don't see any information about sending my name, surname, social security number, all I get seen is a Polish version of some phishing message that says, hey, show me your name and surname, and you get in return a hundred grand. So you can imagine that to be a pretty good phishing vector for, let's say, a website that is trying to impersonate a, a bank. So it shows you, hey, log in with the mCitizen application. You get shown a QR code that you scan, you scan that QR code, you pass the data, and now the threat actor knows what's your name, what's your surname, and he can display it to the website back. Let's say, once you share the data, he says, hey, you're Simon, your maiden name is this and this. Click, this, click, click here to, to complete the process and uh, get a bunch of uh, money from us. But what I'm showing you right now is just a, you know, a f some phishing attempts. It's still, uh, you, you share someone, you share the data with someone, what, but what does it matter that you share some data with someone? Like, Someone knows your name and surname. The, the thing that's still blocking us is the uh, cryptographic verification, which is the most secure process of data verification. So let's, uh, let's make this our next goal to, to break that stuff. In order to, to break it, we basically have to know how it works under the hood. It, it, as you can see, we have a person that, that is the verifier, we have the person that is being verified, and we have the government server. And also, as you can see, the, the person that is, that is being verified has his personal container and his personal certificate. When the verification process starts, the verifier sends uh, the message to the server that says, hey, I'm starting a verification process uh, of this ID, and QR code is generated and is displayed on, on the verifier's phone. Then the person being verified 
scans the QR code, he obtains the, the session ID of the data session exchange uh, ID uh, from the server and also obtains the key for additional encryption. So all data that is, that is sent within the system, all sensitive data is additionally encrypted besides HTTPS traffic. So next, the, the person being verified creates some sort of like a, um, like a blob of data. He takes his, uh, his digital container, which consists all of his data, his name, his surname. He takes the session ID, so the system can differentiate with, between different sessions. He takes some other metadata, and then he signs it with uh, his personal certificate in order to prove that, hey, the, this data, I am signing it, this is in fact me. And additionally, he's encrypting it to to basically ensure that uh, even if you could sniff the traffic, you cannot listen to uh, what the data, what's the data. Then he sends it to the server, and what's important is that the server is basically responsible for verifying the data. So it is not a peer-to-peer -peer process that just the, the server is some intermediary. The, the whole verification happens strictly on the government server side. And once the verification is successful, it's just uh, the server returns some information like, hey, as you can see, as you saw previously, hey, the data has been exchanged securely. So as a result of, of a cryptographic verification, as you've seen previously, a following screen is shown to, to the verifier, but we want to know what's happening under the hood. So what's, what's, what's the real data that is shown from the server to the, to the verifier? So we listen, we um, basically hook the application to listen to the, to the incoming traffic. We listen for any changes in memory. We obtain the following data. As you can see, everything is encrypted, as I've said. So we got to uh, create another process that we listen for the decryption key. We decrypt it in, uh, what it's, uh, when it's uh, being received. And the decrypted uh, data looks as follows. It's a, sim it's a weird JSON file with all your, all your data. Looking, anyone noticing any difference, any similarities to previous slides from the, uh, from the presentation? It turns out that the whole process during the, the whole, during the whole onboarding process, you received two things, the personal container with the government signature and your, and your personal certificate. And it turns out that during the verification process, the verifier receives basically 50% of, of the data that you receive during onboarding. So he doesn't have the, the container, so he doesn't have the, the certificate, so he, let's assume he cannot sign the data, uh, he cannot prove that he is in fact him. Is it really? So if we have someone else's, uh, if we have someone else's digital container, let's just try to sign it as our, our, with our own certificate and try to pass it as a, as a legitimate uh, identity. So the complete attack scenario would look as follows, that we just fish the uh, container out of someone with a phishing QR code. We listen to for the incoming uh, personal container. Once we have that, we can basically uh, inject into the application, change, change our own container into the uh, container of the attacker, sign it, encrypt it, send it to the server, and maybe it will work. Let's see. Uh, the, the attack consists of two stages. The, the first stage is we're trying to gather a personal container of someone else. So as you can see, we have an attacker, we have a victim, victim has its own identity, and an, and an attacker has, a, has generated a phishing QR code. And also, as you can see by the terminal screen, he's listening for, uh, he has a listening setup to listen for any incoming uh, data that is, that, that is gonna be received after the verification process has succeeded. So the attacker shows the QR code to the victim. The victim doesn't know whether it is an attack or not, so he just shares the data. It might be just a legitimate verification attempt. The data is shared, but as you can, as you're gonna see by the terminal window, uh, the attacker will listen and uh, basically capture the, uh, the victim's personal container that he received during the verification process. Now, now that he does have it, the attacker basically doesn't need the, the victim at all. He, can, he can just go about his day, and when the opportunity arises, he, let's say, goes to the bank, and the whole process repeats. 
we have, but, but it's in, um, but it's exchanged. We have an attacker that has his own identity, but he also has that stored container of, of someone else. So he manipulates his own application to first change the, the view of the application so it's more, um, so the app attack is more transparent. So as you can see, the, uh, the, the screen has been changed to, to show the details of, uh, of the victim. And now it's just a standard process of cryptographic verification. So the third party verifier generates a QR code. The, the third party verifier has a pretty standard of the Play Store a version of the application that doesn't require, without any weird modifications. He shows the uh, QR code to, to attacker, which the attacker scans. And now instead of uh, sending the attacker's personal container to the, to the verifier, the attacker sends the container of, of the victim that he has previously uh, captured. So he sends the data, and the cryptographic verification has been successfully uh, achieved with someone else's uh, ID. So yeah, it works. It is, it is a server-side business logic issue during the whole verification process, which is the server did not check uh, whether the container of, of person, whether the certificate is signed with the container of the same person. So basically a mm, container of Bob can be signed with certificate of, of Alice and it, it will be uh, processed successfully. The, the issue works both on iOS and Android, so it's basically uh, on, works basically on all platforms. It's also invisible to the victim, so the victim has no idea that the act attack is happening. He just sees a pretty standard uh, verification process that doesn't uh, look any uh, doesn't look weird, and also uses the fact that the server uh, exposes excessive information. So after the verification process is finished, the verifier basically receives full, um, full container of, of the person he is verified. Why? Since you, I mean, uh, what, what's the, what's the le reason or what's the logic behind that? So, and also what's important is the, the attack can be uh, performed in a, in a manner that I've called collect now and scam later. So you basically can collect a bunch of data, a bunch of containers over, let's say, two weeks, and then just go to the bank and right after another, uh, withdraw all the money from all of the victims. But uh, there's some questions, like how long is the capture container valid for? If the capture container is valid for, let's say, two minutes, then the attack is just pure theory. Like, no one will just go and run to the bank two minutes after he has uh, he has uh, verified someone. It turns out the, the container is valid for five years. So you could basically just collect a bunch of data and after three years, everyone has forgotten about it. You go to the bank and, uh, and you basically can do anything with, with, the, with the person's identity. And then also another question. Let's say I, 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 I think I was, I was attacked. I think someone has uh, captured my, my personal container. What can I do to protect myself? Can I, let's say, uninstall the app? Or is there some revocation process? Or what can I do? Nothing. There is a, uh, the application did support a revocation process, but that process only uh, removed your personal certificate. The, the, since the container is signed by the government, and the, the, the signature of the government is still valid, the, the container in itself is also valid after the revocation. So it's not fine. Uh, you basically have a tool that you can, uh, that you can uh, use to basically access any uh, service or business uh, using someone else's data. And, even, and those businesses are pretty high risk, like you've seen in the practical part part where banks have to rely on, on the cryptographic verification. So we started to, to notify, uh, res uh, to, to fix that issue. We started in August. As you can see, it took me two days to, to discover the, all of the issues. 
and then we started to, to notify certs. The first one cert we, we notified is like a go to shop for when you find some uh, some issue. Uh, they actually t actually told us that hey, this is a government infrastructure. We we are not gonna deal with that. Uh, go talk to another cert. Uh, we did. Uh, we sent them the information. Uh, send, the, send the technical details, but we didn't get a response for three days. So after that, we started to notify the governments, uh, the, uh, re the government sector responsible for creating the, the app directly. So you might want to, you might wonder why, why, why were we in uh, such a hurry? Like only after three days of not receiving any response, we started to notify the government directly. Actually, uh, in the, in the. Um, in the law, it was, it was uh, mentioned that on the 1st of September, every bank in the country has to legally uh, respect the application. So the application in itself was rolled out as a, let's say, a uh, slow release mode. So the application was released. You had two months to onboard yourself, to get acquainted to the application. And after that period, the application would be, like, uh, would be live and you could use it in, in a bank. So on, on the 1st of September, you could basically go to the bank uh, and uh, basically verify yourself, uh, yourself again with someone else's data. After about a month, we, we, we got information from the, uh, from the CERT that the fixes have been implemented. Uh, but in reality, the, the fixes have been implemented way, way sooner than that. When, once, we con once we contacted the government, the, the fixes were introduced in a matter of like two or three days. So what was the government's reaction? It was pretty professionally, I would say, for a pu public sector. The, the response was almost uh, instantaneous. We had a direct meeting with, uh, with the team that is responsible for creating the application. Uh, initial fix, as I've said, was pretty, pretty soon, pretty, pretty quick. And not sure if it's a coincidence or not, but after we've sent them the information about the, the bugs, I've started to, to just watch their careers page. And not long after, the, there was a listing for, for Pentester. So what is it that you can learn from, from, the, from this? Um, from this lecture? Well, it depends on, on who you are, where you're from. So let's start from the obvious. Well, if you're using just, if you're just an average Joe using the digital ID, always use the strongest possible verification method that the system you, you have provides. So if, the, if somehow your system provides a simple verification method of just visual verification, where all you have to do is just look at someone else's screen, that is not gonna gonna fly because the bar for abuse uh, for such an attack is so low that it, it it cannot be trusted. What if you're creating digital ID? And there were some hands that uh, there there were some hands at the beginning of the of the talk that uh, you're not all from Sweden. Uh, you have to prioritize security. So let's imagine uh, just a physical paper money. The, the main function of the money is, uh, is uh, value exchange, but if uh, that paper money doesn't have a security as its principle, then anyone with a printer can, can basically abuse the, the first the value storage and value exchange uh, function of the money. Also, test your solution, and as I've said, the visual verification is not uh, sufficient enough for uh, achieving proper security and also train others how to verify the data. And what if you're integrating into, uh, into existing digital ID? So let's say you're a bank that is required by law to, to, to respect the uh, ID that has been created. Also, use only the strongest verification method, test this, and also train your staff so no red team assessment where you go with a fake application passes and, uh, and, and you can go inside the office. Once, well, also, assess the risk and consequences of using such systems. So, let's say you're a bank, you integrate some external uh, digital ID solution into your system, then you have to cover all the bases of what can go wrong if there is an issue in the, in the system, in the digital, digital ID system that you have to integrate. 
cover those bases, see how it will, how it will affect your business. So that is all for me. Thank you, thank you for listening. If there are any questions, then go ahead. Thank you very much. Really nice talk. So how many of us in here, Swedes, are going to poke at Banky Day now? A lot of us, right? So questions. There got to be questions now. Good. There is people everywhere. This is good. It happened. I told yeah. you. You have some questions. Hi. Uh, when you approach a bank and want to identify yourself with this solution, um, won't the bank then see the face of the real person and are supposed to check that with your face? So will that yep. work unless you're very, if it's your brother or something? Yep, that, that is true. If, if you verify someone, you will see the photo of the person you're trying to attack. But then again, you can ask yourselves, is it possible to be verified? Is it is photo going to be verified? Uh, for my case, my photo in my original ID is when I, w when I was 15 years old. And it still is respected. No one will pretty much, no, no one checks photo for, for uh, authenticity. Unless you're trying to attack, let's say, a woman uh, as a bearded man. Next one. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, do you know if there's any plan to authenticate uh, the verifiers? Um, so, there is, uh, in the issue that I've shown you about the QR codes that you can change the, uh, the, the, the creator's name, the, the final fix that the government I introduced is to just strip that field entirely. So, if you scan the QR code right now, it just shows you, uh, a, it just shows you a generic text like, you're about to share data with some, some unknown user. But, uh, they have introduced a special, like a special way of verification for, let's say, the government system. So I can use that uh, application to, to, let's say, log into the government tax authority with the QR code. And that QR code has a, has a special value that, that shows within the application that I'm, I'm sharing with, with, legit, with legit organization. But other than that, for, for uh, like a, a authenticate a average Joe, no. Thanks. Over there, you're making me work for it, eh? Good. I'm not going to run, but I'm work, walking in a fast pace. Oh, no. How do you even get there? I find you. On the way. Yeah. You could yell. Yeah. Do it, man. No, I'm just Hi. Great talk. Um, I was wondering about the period before you notified the government and the other organizations, um, since this was not enforced by banks before the 1st of October 2023, but you said also something about people were guaranteed that they could identify themselves with this. Um, so this had been in use for some time, I suppose, so for like a year maybe? It was rolled out, it is basically the application is in its 2.0 version. Like three years ago, there was an initial version that was, uh, that was created. And I think it, was, it just wasn't uh, in line with the EU regulations. So they created another one that was basically in, it, in, the, in the period that, that was before the banks could, uh, could use it was a, like a transition period from the version one to the version two. But the, the code base was for the okay. second version. Okay, so then the question is, do you know if there have like if uh, people have analyzed previous in-person impersonification, whatever the word is, attacks and seen, okay, these attacks were probably made with the uh, ways that you have listed now. So has this been known by attackers uh, before you found Not that I know of. I, I don't think there is a uh, described, uh, some press, uh, press described uh, attack, but there has been a, tool just um, uh, in the in the dark web you could you could basically buy a tool that basically achieved the same goal as the m hacker tool that I have shown and created so I think it was uh, uh, there were instances of it being used but it wasn't any it wasn't documented and on a large scale 
Anyone else? Last one? Yep. Yeah. Hi, uh, nice talk. Uh, it kind of related to the last question, uh, but maybe you didn't really answer it. Do you know if there is like a, how do, can the government track uh, these kinds of abuses somehow in their way? Like, if you manage to break it as you did now, but maybe in the future, do you know if they have ways to see it or is it on their part, just yes, like an uh, opaque? Uh, Not sure about their uh, detection mechanisms because I don't work for the government. But uh, maybe. Maybe they have some some uh, some logs that try to catch up potentially some mismatch in, in data, but I'm not sure and, and cannot say, cannot say for certainty. Okay, thank you very much, Simon. Thank you.